So again, welcome everyone. Welcome to this conversation with Mattia Salvini on sound and meaning chanting in the study of Buddhist Sanskrit. I'm Karin Myers. I'm director of Mangalam Research Center in Berkeley, California, which is also homeland to the Ohlone people who also still live here. Um, before I turn things over to Mattia this evening, I'd like to say a little bit about this talk in the context of um, Mangalam Research Center and upcoming Mangalam Research Center programs. So um, the mission of Mangalam Research Center is to uh, promote um, the study of um, Buddhist languages and also and translation and and we sometimes interpret that broadly as the translation of Buddhist teachings for Western students. But here in this talk this evening we'll be sp focusing specifically on language. And um, my colleague uh, Tillich is going to share with you a link to the language programs at Mangalam Research Center. Um, actually, the inspiration um, for the, this talk, inviting Mattia to come um, this evening, is also the inspiration behind our upcoming Sanskrit course. And so uh, years ago, I taught at um, Rangjung Yeshe Institute in Nepal at um, the Center for Buddhist Studies there. And Mattia had been there several years earlier teaching Sanskrit. And when Mattia came to visit, I, I was talking with him about his project of using Buddhist language and especially chanting to um, a Buddhist, sorry, Buddhist vocabulary, Buddhist texts to study Sanskrit. Because I and many people who've studied Sanskrit in the West, it's often through Hindu materials. And for those of us who are in Buddhist studies, it's a real treat to get to learn the language through, you know, Buddhist materials right away, rather than waiting till year two, three, four, <laughs> until we get to read some Buddhist texts in my case. Um, so in any case, that was the inspiration for our upcoming Sanskrit course, where we'll be using materials um, designed by Mattia, emphasizing Buddhist vocabulary and also chanting. And that should be in the link that um, Tillich shared. And um, the, um, that will start on September uh, 6th, and it will be 12 weeks in the fall. And if you'd like to continue, 12 weeks in the spring. I also wanted to announce an upcoming talk on July 31st. Um, in the morning at um, 10 a.m., or at least in the morning Pacific time, 10 a.m. to 11.30. Um, there'll be a talk with um, Ligeia Lugli on um, computing the Dharma, new tools to explore uh, Buddhist Sanskrit literature. So Ligeia has been working for several years at the Buddhist um, translation workbench at um, Mangalam Research Center, developing um, um, com computer <laughs> tools to study um, Sanskrit texts. And, and so I, I encourage you to come to that um, talk as well, if you're interested in all things Buddhist Sanskrit. So um, let me before, um, oh, and I'll let you know a little bit about the um, format for this evening. So um, after I turn things over to Mattia, he'll be speaking for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have all of the rest of the time until 7.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific to do a question and answers. And at that time, you can raise your hand to ask a question, or if you'd like to put a question in the chat, we'll also be taking a look at that. So without any further ado, let me introduce Mattia. Uh, Mattia Salvini is Dean of Scriptural Languages at the International College in Songkhla, Thailand. He has studied Sanskrit in Chennai, um, as well as at um, SOAS in, in London. Um, and his main research interests are um, Buddhist philosophy is expressed in Sanskrit, especially Madhyamaka philosophy. 
um, the relationship between philosophy and grammar, the relationship between different Indian Buddhist schools, Buddhist sutras in Sanskrit and Tibetan, and Buddhist poetry. Um, while staying in India and Nepal, Mattia had the opportunity to study with Professor um, Ram uh, Shankar Tripathi at um, in Sarnath and several um, Tibetan Buddhist masters, especially um, Ayang Rinpoche, Lama Gelong Tsultrim Gyaltsen, and Lama Rinchen Punsuk. So um, welcome, Matteo. We're so pleased to have you this evening, and I might need to ask you to unmute yourself. Thank you, Kari. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction, and thank you to Mangalan Center. I'm, I'm very happy to give this talk at Mangalam. I should mention before I start with anything further that we have a connection which starts from when I was a child in a way because, uh, or maybe even before I was born because uh, Tripathi Guruji uh, knew Tartan Turku Rinpoche quite well. And I believe he actually visited at some point California. That's what Sanjoy was reminding me of. And indeed, although his name was Rama, he's the one who told me once, when you teach Sanskrit and you write your own grammar, instead of Ramaha, Rama, or Ramaha, put Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. So somehow he instilled part of the initial idea. And that's what I did. I, I had in the beginning Ramaha, Rama, or Ramaha, because that's how I myself had learned but then I changed it and slowly I made my grammar more and more Buddhist in terms of examples, uh, not entirely, like there's elements which are not just from the Buddhist tradition, but I decided that rather than using this uh, Rama Bhakta kind of framework, I could use a Bauddha type of framework. So this is some kind of link, apart from the fact that, yes, we have this link through Ranjung Yeshe and through Sarnath and through Soas, because I happen to have met Ligeia twice in Sarnath and in Soas. So somehow this seems to be a very good Pratitya Samuppada. So uh, as uh, you have mentioned, I will talk for about 30 minutes and uh, then I will be happy to hear questions because this talk is geared primarily to people who wish to learn Sanskrit and might have certain concerns, certain anxieties even about approaching Sanskrit, especially for the study of Buddhism. Therefore, in the PDF that I am sharing, I have numbered most of my points so that if anyone has a doubt or a question related to a part of the talk, they could note the number of that point and it will make it easier for me to go back to it if necessary. So now what you see is the letter A, is the representation of the letter A in uh, the Ranjana Lipi. And uh, much of my talk will have to do with the letter A. So let me start with uh, Mangara Acharana. Avikalpita Sankalpa Apratishti Tamanasa Asmriti Amasi Kara Niralamba Namostute. So this is from the Jnana Loka Lankara Sutra, the ornament of the light of awareness. And this is Manjushri's praise to the Buddha. And you can see the letter A appearing here four times at very crucial junctions. And this is very important word, uh, manasikara, which I will get back to, to in a later part of the talk. I will not even explain exactly what this means. And I will explain why I'm not explaining it in a way during the talk itself. Another famous Mangala Acharana, Anirodham Anutpadam Anutshedam Ashashvatam Anekartam Ananartam Anagama Manirgamam Yapratitya Samutpadam Prapancho Pashamam Shivam Deshayamasa Sambuddha Stamvande Vadatam Param. So this is from the 
Mula Madhyamaka Karika. It's the Mangala Ajarana of the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, where the, rather remarkably, the first uh, eight words all start with the letter A, and they're all negations. So is there something special about the letter A? Yes, I think so. The title of this talk comes from a um, definition of poetry by Bamaha. Bamaha being one of the very early literary critics, if we want to translate in this manner the idea of Alankara Shastra, those who discuss the nature of poetry, of literature rather, what makes our diction literary. literary. And for Bhamaha is the coming together of sound and meaning, Shabda and Artha, of word and meaning, Shabda and Artha. So here you can already notice something rather interesting that the Sanskrit term for word is the same term used for sound. So Sanskrit is primarily a set of sounds. And I think this is a very simple idea that nevertheless influences the way in which Sanskrit texts are composed, the way in which they are taught, and the way which, in which they are learned, which is mostly through sound, and therefore through human interaction in presence. This is, I think, something very important for the Sanskrit tradition. So this rather simple definition tells us something which I think is quite profound, that literature is, uh, brings very close the sound and the meaning. The, when we are able to use the appropriate sounds to convey the appropriate meaning, even through their suggestive qualities, their musical qualities. That's where we go from ordinary diction towards something literary. literary. So although this is a rather simple definition, I think it has ample ramifications and it can help us better appreciate what we read. And uh, as an example of an echo of this type of uh, definition and idea, rather than going to the usual Vagartha Viva Sanskripta, Sanskripta of Kalidasa, we can actually look at Dharmakirti. There's a rather beautiful verse by Dharmakirti, this verse that you see now on the screen. Shailar Bandayati Smavanara Hrtair Balmiki Ramboni Dim. Vyasa parta shareista tapina tayo at yukti rudbhavyate bhagartao chatuladhrita vivata tapyas manni bandam nayam loko dushaitum prasarita mukhas to bhyam pratishte namaha. What is this about? I will not explain clearly the whole verse, but I will just point out he's saying something a little funny. So what he's saying is look, look at what Balmiki did. We were talking about the Ramayana earlier, implicitly. Well, Valmiki, he, um, he put rocks, like stones on the ocean. That too, these rocks were brought by monkeys. And uh, Vyasa in the Mahabharata did something similar with the arrows of Bartha. So they covered the ocean in rocks and they covered the ocean in uh, arrows. And yet nobody points out that they said something too much. On the other hand, in my case, word and meaning are tuladratau iva as if placed on a perfect scale. They're perfectly balanced. And yet the word criticizes what I write. O oh, fame, I bow to you homage to you. So he's complaining that these famous poets, they all exaggerate. I write in a very balanced manner in respect to both word and meaning, and yet they criticize me instead of criticizing them. And of course, there is, it's kind of a joke because it doesn't really mean to criticize Valmiki and uh, Vyasa, but he, the emphasis is on this balance of word and meaning even in, his, uh, in this particular verse. I should add that if you happen to go to Rameshwara um, in, um, in Tamil Nadu, you will find that there is a temple where they do show you the rocks 
floating on water and those are the rocks used for the purpose of building the famous bridge to Lanka. Okay, so that was a bit of Sanskrit explained very rapidly and just to give you some sense of familiarity with the sounds. These are the main points that I would like to introduce as kind of what I would have liked to hear and I didn't hear that much maybe when I was a beginner Sanskrit student at the very, very beginning, what would have helped me to know? So that I'm thinking of um, prospective students, what, what they might find uh, to be some doubts, something that uh, they're not used to do. So first point, don't think that every time you read something, you need to straight away understand every detail. Now, this might sound like obvious, but I've noticed that uh, many students panic when they are unable to follow what is going on in a text. Now, one of the first times, one maybe my very first class in my college in Chennai was uh, on uh, Kumara Sambhava, so a text by Kari Dasa. And uh, I had just studied Sanskrit on my own for one year. I had never been to India. And in South India, they happen to pronounce Sanskrit very rapidly. So basically, I sat in the class. Our teacher recited a verse, gave a generic explanation, and that was it. That's it. So for me, in terms of understanding what was going on in the sentence, was about 0 to 0.5%. But they told me from the beginning, don't worry about it. Just get the general sense of the verse, repeat it a few times, slowly, slowly the sound and the meaning will come together. And I think this is a very basic point for Sanskrit learning, trying to aim at gaining familiarity in the beginning, rather than trying to sort out every single detail. Sanskrit grammar has a lot of detail, but this detail is not just meant to confuse us. Uh, if we try to acquire all the grammatical knowledge in the abstract, and then kind of apply it like a tool, to what we're going to read later, it usually doesn't work because the grammar is fairly rich. And what happens is by the time we start reading, we just have forgotten most of it. And we have to go back to it again and like what's going on. It's, and it's a bit like swimming. Like when we swim, maybe we learn some very basic thing and then we start going in the water. We don't try to get all the movement of all the possible styles of swimming perfectly outside of the water and only then jump into the water. That simply doesn't work very well. So it's better to not worry too much if in the beginning it's not very clear and aim at gaining clarity gradually through familiarity. So that's the very first thing. And this translates also when we are reading a single text. When we attempt to read a text the first time, I notice some students, unless they have perfectly understood one paragraph, they don't go to the next. Now, this doesn't work with Sanskrit texts very often, both in terms of the basic grammar and in terms of the content of the texts, because the texts are just not designed that way. Uh, it's, a, it's so obvious, like when we read even, let's say, the Abhidharma Kosha, we will not understand what is Asrava until much later in the text, and yet it's one of the very first things that it is introduced. So slowly, as we acquire familiarity with the system, the pieces start falling into place. They, they start making sense together. So it is better to leave something slightly unclear, go to the next paragraph, and be ready to reread the text many times. I think this is another very basic point, which uh, regards both 
acquiring familiarity with the grammar, as well as trying to understand the content of the text more broadly. Now, in respect to chanting, which is uh, one of the main topics today, basic point, don't ever try to memorize. Uh, am I saying that we should not memorize? No, that's not what I mean. The best way to memorize is not to try to do it, but just to repeat something a high number of times. So take a good amount of text and repeat it 30 times, 70 times, 130 times, 210, 300, 350. Just repeat many, many times. At some point, you will yourself know that you know the text, even without trying to repeat it. And it will remain in your mind for much longer. If you just try to memorize one line, Buddha, 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 and until you memorize the, you go to the next line, it might look like to you, you're making progress, tangible progress, but it's not long-term progress. And it doesn't train the mind towards long-term memory. So this is one point, don't try to memorize, chant significant amounts of text and chant them many times. And then general point, which regards both sound and meaning. This method of learning is meant in my opinion to counter this tendency that now we have, and I include myself in it, to be constantly exposed to scattered bits of knowledge. Now, this really doesn't work well with the Sanskrit Shastras because they are holistic systems. That's also why we need to read them many times. All the parts are connected. They are kind of Samuha, like this passage here uh, mentioned. This is from Yashomita. They are a Samuha. They're we have to get a mental image of the whole. It is just a mental image, but it is required. If we just focus on some small details, the meaning of those details will lack their proper context and therefore will be severely impoverished. The Shastras, even very short ones, like let's say the 20 verses of Vasubandhu have such deep internal connections between the parts that we can read them so many times and get more and more out of them. So in that sense, get into this mentality that these are holistic systems of learning, that all the parts are connected. This requires an investment of time and effort and long-term reflection. I think this is also quite important. Now, I would like to uh, show you a quote that very timely Professor Skilling sent me, knowing that I was uh, giving this talk, he just wrote some thoughts about it. And he was saying that he tells students to just read. That means even if you don't really follow what, what is going on clearly, just read, take the, he was mentioning the sutras and suttas mainly, read them many times, just keep on reading and slowly the text will gradually take care of itself. That's a good way to put it. Of course, we have to uh, gradually introduce the element of grammatical understanding in our reading, but we shouldn't wait for that. We should read, and by read, I mean read aloud, chant. That I think is really uh, important. I'm going to repeat this point. So now I'm going to go point by point. Uh, general benefits of chanting. So what do I mean by general benefits? Uh, by general benefits, I mean benefits which would apply to both Buddhist practitioners and non-Buddhists. So when we chant, we are reminded what that there is a performative element, an enjoyable element to our learning. And we try to gain some kind of feel for the language 
trying to read the language at some point rather than solving it like a puzzle. This is also something which I think has become a plague to Sanskrit learning, that many people try to solve sentences like a puzzle, then recast them into another language, usually English, and then think through the English. That means they never really read Sanskrit. They just solve it like a problem, like an obstacle even towards the meaning. Sanskrit is not what discloses the meaning, but rather it's like an obstacle to be kind of demolished so that we can reach the meaning. That is a completely wrong approach in my opinion. And if that's the approach, then better just not learn another language. Since when, when we get to the translation, we should already have understood the meaning, the overall meaning. That really is quite important. And regarding music, there is, yes, there is a musical element to chanting. Of course, there is a, this point of Vinaya, monks should not really sing. And where is really the dividing line? Well, monks definitely are allowed to chant. There, there is probably a way to kind of understand intuitively what qualifies as chanting and what qualifies as music. I think we can kind of understand it. If, if I say, evam maya shrutam me kasmin samaye bhagavan raja grihe, this would be chanting. If uh, we go through a very decorative way of singing, evam maya shrutam, and we go on like this, maybe we go towards music. However, chanting is not a problem. And chanting was valued even at the time of Nalanda. There's a very beautiful section of eating uh, travelogue where it describes the method of chanting that they used in India. It's really something quite inspiring and I would encourage everyone to read it. Also, I noticed that Trent uh, Walker is uh, participating. Thank you for joining. I would recommend you a talk that he recently gave on uh, musical aspects of uh, chanting and Buddhist recitation. I think that that actually, for those people who have some love of music is very inspiring. And uh, so I will not elaborate, but I would recommend you to have a look at his talk. Now, again, going back to Shastras as holistic systems, how does chanting help us understand the nature of the texts? Well, the first thing I would like to say is if you chant, you will see it. But of course, that's not much of an explanation. But there is, um, there is an element of memory that is very important in the Sanskrit text. So just the structure of root text and uh, commentary gives you an idea of this. Now we, we often are presented with a root text and commentary together. But if we were to look at manuscripts, you will notice that the root text is often not there. It is assumed that we already know it. So when we read the commentary, it is really quite different of an experience if we already have much of the root text in our memory. Because we can also follow much more easily when the commentator is uh, offering a cross reference to a different part of the text. And we have already a, a kind of overall image of where the text is going, which happens to be very precious for these texts which refer to themselves so often. So chanting has this quality of giving us this general overall image of the text, overall uh, mental image of the structure of the text. And of course, it allows us to reflect on the text throughout the day. If we have the text in our memory, of course, whatever we are doing, some ideas from the text might come back to our mind and allow us to reflect on the text. And of course, this will help us both with the Shabda and with the Artha. We will acquire vocabulary and bring it close to the, the meaning intended by those Shastras. Also, something banal but of extraordinary importance, even for textual criticism, recognizing verses. Now, if you're reading a manuscript, the verse is not graphically presented as a verse. 
But if you have chanted quite a bit of verses, you will see it immediately. And meter is very often important to establish a preferred reading. So even in the very uh, slight orthographical irregularity in the very first verse that I recited today, Amanasi Kara, but that can be made sense of quite easily, I believe, if we take into account meter. So if somebody looked at it and thought, oh, what's going on with that long E, then they can consider the meter and that will be immediately recognizable when someone has familiarity with meter. And this kind of thing happens quite often. It's also especially important in Buddhist texts because as you know, the, especially the Gata sections of Mahayana Sutras have certain irregularities which have been called a Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. I don't like that term, I don't use it, but nevertheless, uh, there are these irregularities and meter allows us to often uh, understand when it is the case to correct or amend the text or when that kind of orthography is really intended. So in that respect, uh, I feel that uh, it is very important apart from the musical element, because of course meter is, we can understand meter as being the same as the uh, Tara in uh, the musical systems. It's like the, um, the, the rhythmic scansion of the language. So it really does help to get a feel for Sanskrit where long and short syllables or long and short letters are so crucial. Oh, okay. I have five minutes, I've been a little bit slow. The role of memory and mindfulness in understanding. Well, I have kind of touched upon it. It's because of the nature of the text. Being able to remain mindful of what one is studying throughout the day and being able to remember different parts of the text while reading other parts is going to be so helpful with the Sanskrit Shastras. Now, a point that uh, might sound political, but is not decolonization. What do, I, what do I mean by that? I mean it as a metaphor, which is using Buddhist thought not as something at the periphery of our mind from which to get resources to be used from a different mental center, but rather placing it within the center of our intellectual life. And to do that, I think that partly our didactic habits have to change, have to be more attuned and geared towards studying Buddhist texts and respecting their intended didactics. And this can also be um, summarized through the word Sahradaya, which is a word used in Alankara Shastra, which means having a similar heart, having a similar mind as the author. So there is this idea that uh, as much as the poet, the literary uh, author has to have a sense uh, of inspiration and uh, uh, refinement, mental refinement, that much is also required from the audience. So many of the texts on Alankara Shastra are not just meant for poets to write their poetry more effectively, but they're meant for the audience to be able to refine one's mind and become more attuned to the diction of the text. And I think this should be also one of our aims, to become Sahradaya with the authors of these texts and uh, gain some kind of uh, inner resonance of their meaning and of their suggestions. Now, benefits for Buddhist practitioners. I've divided them into two. The first ones are for all Buddhist practitioners and the second one are more specifically Mahayana. Regarding all types of Buddhist practitioners, first, foremost, obvious benefit, merit, punya. So I think all Buddhist traditions will agree that chanting Buddhist texts is a source of merit. These texts are connected to the Buddha's own speech and to the speech of great masters. So in one way or the other, they are accumulation of merit. Smriti and Samadhi. Of course, this type of learning goes already towards 
focused attention and therefore it goes towards the development of samadhi. Unlike much of the type of learning that we are bound to be exposed to if we learn in a modern setting, which is a very quick type of uh, conceptual activity and therefore doesn't necessarily help towards samadhi. So doing this kind of learning through chanting will introduce an element which helps our practice of samadhi rather than becoming an obstacle to samadhi. Then the, the steps of wisdom, of course, you know that is Shrutamayi, Chintamayi, and Bhavanamayi. So it starts from the wisdom which comes from uh, listening. And, and here it is described by Shomitra as first step is the first type of wisdom follows the meaning of the Shastra after having heard the Shastra. Shastra Shravanat Tadartam Anusarati. And that's not even yet the Shrutamaya, Shrutamayi Pratnya. After that comes the Shrutamayi Pratnya. So the Shrutamayi Pratnya, the, the wisdom which comes from listening, is actually maybe a little higher than what we normally uh, understand it as. So first we follow that meaning and then we get a certain kind of wisdom just through that. And that is the Shrutamayi Pratnya. That I think uh, this kind of uh, division of steps in Yashomitra actually surprised me because I hadn't thought about it too much, except there is something to this extent in the um, Uttaratantra Shastra, the Ratnagotra Vibhaga, which speaks very highly just of the wisdom from hearing the treatise. It's something I would invite you to check. Then, of course, maintaining a connection with the Dharma. I think this is kind of obvious. Uh, if we spend time with this text, which this gives us the opportunity to remain connected with the Buddhist teachings, and I mean both in these lives and the next, because uh, if, I mean, if we reflect on my own life, it looks like a series of just fortuitous coincidences that I got interested in reading these texts. And I have a sincere anxiety that will it happen again? So my guess is that if I keep on spending time with this text, my chances to come into contact with these texts in future lifetimes are much higher. And therefore, I think one could just chant out of that kind of anxiety. Oh, I'm never going to be able to read the Abhidharma Purusha again, better chant it, something along those lines. Then of course, Vasana, very deep, uh, influence to the subtler layers of the mind. Now, this is just what Shantideva says. Swamano vasaitum kratam mayedam in the Bodhicharya Avatara. That's why he uh, has uh, the main reason he has produced the Bodhicharya Avatara is actually to influence his own mind. Becoming Utgatitadnya and Vitnya Purusha. Utgatitadnya means someone who can catch hints. This is a good type of Buddhist practitioner who can understand just through a few hints. Now, my argument is that learning Sanskrit in this more traditional way uh, with the appreciation of the beauty of the language allows us to become attuned to the finer suggestions, even musical suggestions of the language, which are also relevant when we read the Shastras because Vasubandhu, Chandrakirti, Nagarjuna, they are fantastic Sanskrit authors. They're very fine writers. They're very subtle writers in both their prose and their verses. And we can get so much more out of those beautiful verses and prose if we have some sense of the rasa, the kind of flavor of Sanskrit literature. Then specific benefits for Mahayana practitioners I cannot explain this now at length because I'm already late, but uh, I can summarize it with the very first point, which is becoming closer to the meaning of the letter A. The importance of the letter A in Sanskrit, which is this uh, short sound, A, uh, slightly closed, the first sound that will come, up, come out if we just open our 
mouth and let out a brief sound. We understand it much better if we are close to the sounds of Sanskrit. And uh, Panini himself starts with his, his grammar with the letter A and ends it with the letter A. So the first sutra is I un, the last sutra is a a. So it starts with short a, ends in short a. Who is Panini? Great grammarian. Oh, but he's not Buddhist. Well, not according to the Buddha. The Buddha actually prophesied Panini. Here is the prophecy, a prophecy about Panini from the Manjushri Mula Kalpa. Niyatam uh, Shravaka Tvena. He was a Shravaka. And uh, he was a practitioner of uh, Loki, Lokisha, which is Lokesha, and especially a practitioner of the Kroda, Halahala. So very interesting point. We don't associate Sanskrit grammar with Buddhism. I think that's a mistake. Then, of course, the Pradnya Paramita in one letter is the letter A. The letter A is a door to all the dharmas because of uh, non arising from the beginning. A is a negation. Amana Sikara, this word which was in the initial verse, Advaya Vajra Maitripa points out that this can be non placing in the mind or it can mean placing in the mind the letter A. And the two things are very close to each other. Now, I will not elaborate, but I think this is quite uh, remarkable. Then, Mula Madhyamaka Karika, if everything is empty, then we have all sorts of problems. Nagarjuna's answer is if everything is not empty, but what's the difference between these two? Yadishunyam or Yadyashunyam is just one small a. Uh. We find this also in poetry. Um, now I'll skip some things. There's something from Kukai as well on the different letters. But I want to show you the invisible letter A. Dioni ladi rupatwe bachyorta kinni bandanaha. Dioni ladi rupatwe bachyorta kinni bandanaha. Now, the difference between these two in terms of sound is nothing. But there is an invisible letter A between the word Dio and Niladi, which makes the two halves of this verse mean the opposite, basically. So uh, this is from Dharmakirti. This is something that Buddhist authors really like, even in poetry, to invert things, either to repeat the same verse with one small change, which makes it inverted in meaning, or just the same verse. I think many of you will know Shanti Deva. If there is a, rem if there is a remedy, what's uh, the point of being sad? If there is no remedy, what's the point of being sad? And this, this idea of just adding a negation and reverting the, the, reversing the meaning is very common in Buddhist text. Now, I have uh, somewhat skipped through some things very rapidly, but I numbered uh, the different points. So if you have questions regarding some points you want me to expand upon, them, please do let me know. Maybe I will just stop here. If later there is time, I will show you some short videos as well. But now I want to stop so that maybe I can take some questions. Yeah, thank you, Mattia. And I don't know if you want to stop sharing screen so if when people ask questions, they can come on, or do you want to keep that oh, up? Yes. Or, yeah. I can do that. If okay. I then, if, if I want me to once again show something that I've already shown, then I, I will share it again. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. That was such a rich um, presentation. And I'd like um, people to, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. You can also put it in the chat. And I did see um, one question in the chat already. Um, and so this, I'll start with that question in the chat. Um, and so it says, um, holding previous textual information in mind is often difficult um, for me due to a learning difference. Mm -hmm. How can I make the most out of my Sanskrit studies? Uh, I think that... Uh... I don't want to give um, an answer based on partial information. I do not know exactly your learning difference and therefore I cannot offer a kind of very well informed answer. 
but I've had students with uh, learning differences, um, with different types of uh, mild forms of autism, I think, for example. Uh, but usually they find that chanting helps them. I mean, I, I insist on the same point for everything. It's not like a universal cure, but it seems that chanting without even worrying very much whether you memorize or not, uh, whether you understand or not. I know it sounds very weird, but in terms of a very long-term commitment to learning in a relaxed way and being able to enjoy it, I think should have some positive uh, effect even on someone who has a slight learning difference. At the very least, learning to enjoy the process of learning, not just focusing on an immediate result, I think is very important. And of course, this depends very much from how much you like music, for example, how much you like sounds. But if you have some feel for beautiful sounds, slowly being able to repeat those sounds that you like and enjoy it while you do it, as opposed to once you get the final result of learning, whatever that might be, I think that in itself is very positive. In other words, not being too much target driven, understand that the result will arise on its own accord by gathering the causes and conditions, rather than thinking of the result as a kind of apple, which is very high on the tree and you have to jump with as much effort as possible to catch it. Instead of thinking in, in that way, think in terms of, I'm going to plant the right tree and wait for the apple to fall on its own accord. Something along those lines, I think, is behind this method of repeated chanting. I do not know if yeah. it really answers, but. Yeah, um, and you can put more info in the chat if that didn't answer your question. Um, and I'd like to say too, that you know, having taught intensive Sanskrit using the kind of common West <laughs> method that we often use, where it's a cramming a lot of grammar, right? Like as you explained, cramming the grammar at the beginning and then you start reading um, and it's, it, is not a happy process for many students. So um, I'm very excited to try <laughs> a different a different approach. Um, yes, that, that's what, well, it's because it's, uh, this comes out of my own suffering with learning. I, I started learning Sanskrit on my own, but I, from the very beginning, I started by chanting. And I mean, that was at a time when I could not access things through the internet. So basically, I got a cassette of the Bhagavad Gita and I would repeat so many times, Dharma Kshetra, Kuru Kshetra, Samaveta, Yudsabaha. And for me, that was enough. Like, I was so happy to do that. And then I got Colson and uh, Ramaha Rama Ramaha. So, what I would do, I had to work as a waiter. So whenever I was in the, in the times when I didn't have to bring some food to somebody, I would just stand on my own and in my mind say, Rama, 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 Rama. And I was so happy to do that. So that for me was such an enjoyable experience as opposed to have this amazing pressure to learn grammar quickly and understand every single detail of it. I had to do that for Tibetan and I literally had, and I hope he doesn't hear me. I mean, I don't mean it as a reflection of his method because it was very nice, but I had, I had uh, nightmares of my instructor threatening me with a knife for not having done my homework. So, uh, and I'm the kind of person who, when I'm told to do homework, I don't do it. So for me, it was really a, a torture to learn in that way. But learning through chanting and thinking that I'm, I do something that I like, I really like to chant. I like the sounds of this language. 
It doesn't matter. Now I don't understand it. Later I will understand it. So introducing an element of enjoyment, I think is very important in one's learning. And for some people like myself, if I'm told to do something that I don't enjoy, I will postpone it as much as possible and I will get stressed. So for people who are a bit like me that need this element of enjoyment, I think introducing chanting and also music, again, I would like to suggest you to have a look at Trent's video because he had some very good suggestions regarding how to go along with the music. And sometimes, yes, it's not even, one should not even worry, is my pronunciation perfect? Am I chanting with the same exact melody like the other person? It doesn't matter, actually. Uh, as long as you respect some basic uh, points about the length of the um, vowels, it doesn't matter if the pronunciation of the consonants is not yet perfect. It doesn't matter if you're not able to reproduce the same exact melody. It's not so important, actually. This is a point that my own Sanskrit teacher has told me. It's not so fixed. Um, I had one student from Cambodia, never learned Sanskrit before, but I asked students from different parts of the world to just learn a Sanskrit verse and recite it. And she came up with such a nice melody for it, which came obviously from the Cambodian tradition, the way they recite uh, Cambodian uh, verses. It was uh, just an enrichment from my perspective and probably somebody might have um, chanted verses in Sanskrit in Cambodia a thousand years ago. I think it's quite possible. Okay, this... Uh... Yeah. So there's some questions, some more questions in um, the chat. Um, and one was about the, there was one about um, Amana Sikara. Yes. And then, yeah, so we'll start with that one. And okay, anyone then. who has a question can also raise, raise your hand and you can just ask it directly. Okay, Amana Sikara is a very big topic. Um, I introduced it because Maitriba has this very beautiful argument in a text called Amanasikara Adhara that we can take this word as uh, nunch, negation, so meaning not placing in the mind any dharma, which basically means the kind of inner freedom that comes from a realization of the emptiness of all the dharmas. And this is discussed also in the bhavana kram so this is it doesn't mean as kamala shila explains if you try not to think of all the dharmas just by that you're thinking of them so it doesn't mean that so it's a mahayana idea connected to the realization of emptiness but in this reversal this very beautiful reversal Maitripa says, well, but it can also mean placing in the mind the letter A. And, and the paradox is, since the letter A represents selflessness and emptiness and non-arising, the two things are kind of the same. But then it goes more in the context of generation and completion stage in the text. So that part I cannot explain. If you happen to have the appropriate permissions, I would recommend you to study the text, possibly with a master who has the transmission. But there is this uh, idea of Amana Sikara, which is not really very common in non-Mahayana Buddhism. Although I want to express uh, one exception that I know of, which is uh, there is a great Buddhist master in Thailand, is Theravada Buddhist master from the Thai tradition, whom I really respect very much for his uh, insight. And uh, one of the times I went to meet him, he just started giving a teaching on the letter A, to my surprise, because I was not aware of this within this tradition. And uh, I've asked him to record one of such teachings. He has recorded it, so in future maybe I I'm trying to get it translated it now. Once it will be translated, I will make it available. So I should correct myself by saying that 
at least in the oral tradition, it exists also outside of the Mahayana fold. Okay, uh, now there is something from Sanjoy, I think. Can you reflect a little bit about the difference between hybrid Sanskrit and classical Sanskrit? Well, I do not like this terminology very much. I prefer to speak of different registers of Sanskrit. Now, people think that in the Buddhist tradition there is hybrid Sanskrit and then you go to so-called Hindu texts. I also don't like this word. And you get this uh, perfectly classical Sanskrit. This is an abysmal simplification because there is something called Arsha Prayoga in general in uh, Sanskrit texts. And this idea of the usage of the rishis is used both by both Buddhist and non-Buddhist authors to justify certain irregular usages. Also, there is the idea of Bauta Prayoga, which is brought up by some uh, Buddhist grammarians. So there is there's registers of Sanskrit. Mm, I think we can think of Sanskrit like a kind of a grammatical idea, a register which appears in uh, what now we might even call different languages. The, the grammars of Prakrit languages very often are completely derivative from uh, Sanskrit grammars with the addition of certain rules. And uh, Sanskrit and Prakrit, I believe, are mutually comprehensible. It's something you can um, observe by reading Nārakas. In Nārakas, different characters speak different languages, but they are mutually comprehensible, just like Sanskrit and Pali for the most. And this I can tell you from my own personal experience. At Soas, there was one Burmese monk who used to speak Pali. So I used to speak to him in Sanskrit. He would speak to me in Pali. And we would mostly understand each other because the languages are so close. They are really, I'm tempted to say they are different registers of the same language. So in, from that respect, I think we have to look at what has been called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit also from that perspective. That too is not a unified language. This is a, another point why I don't really like that term because it's almost like single Mahayana sutras have their own languages to some extent. If you look at the Samadhi Radha Sutra, it will be a little bit different from looking at certain irregularities found in the Pradnyaparamita, uh, Ratnaguna Sanjayagata, etc. So that term is something I would take with some caution and uh, keep in mind that it refers to a spectrum of languages. Now, one point that I made earlier is that chanting will help us follow that particular register of Sanskrit because sometimes it will help us understand whether this is an intended irregularity or whether this is something that we want to amend in the text because we have this problem that texts are not transmitted so regularly or so perfectly, which, I mean, it's not a huge problem actually from my own perspective, but in any case, the, it means that very often we have to reflect whether something has gone wrong with the text and uh, we might have to decide to make some small changes. So, yeah, I do not know whether this answers your question, uh, Sanjoy. I think this, you just asked. Yeah, thank you very much, Ajahn. Yeah, you're muted. Okay. You mentioned that we should see a lecture or read a paper on the nature of music and meaning. What was the name of the author? Trent, Trent Walker. Oh, yeah. And he oh. shared that in the a link to a lecture. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I, I really recommend that. Okay, here is the video. Yeah. Thanks. I think the next question is about there's one about Visarga and also ah, yeah, one yeah, about yeah, yeah. monastic learning, which I think would be especially interesting. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, there are some sounds that are not pronounced in the same way 
in different parts of South Asia. One of them is Visarga. So the pronunciation I'm most accustomed to is to pronounce Visarga as a slight repetition of the last vowel sounds that precedes it. So for example, Buddha. There are some who pronounce it much more lightly, like Buddha. Uh, I prefer the first method, although there is the exception of the uh, Upadmaniya and Jihuamuliya. So when Kaka and Papa follow, I would pronounce as Buddha Kadati or Buddha uh, Pibati. Uh, so the H and F sound also are present, but that actually is regarded to be optional by many Sanskritists. And so I have friends from Nepal who follow that optionally. I know other people who don't follow it at all. So, but my own preference is generally to follow that method. That's the way I was taught and uh, to pronounce the Visarga even with this kind of echo, vowel echo, because it seems to me clearer and easier to follow. Now regarding the R sound, again, there's some differences. In some parts of India, it is pronounced almost like Ri. In some parts of India, like Ru. In Sri Lanka also is close to Ru, but uh, I learned it as R and L. And that's the pronunciation I, I follow. However, we should be aware that there are certain regional variations in the pronunciation of Sanskrit. Again, I don't think it's a very big problem because they are usually, usually mutually comprehensible. There are some speakers that uh, I remember when we were studying in uh, our BM, they made one of our, we had two teachers from Kerala, one we could perfectly follow, Another one we couldn't follow very well because in that case, there was a difficulty in following the difference between voiced and unvoiced consonants, which were, it was very subtle in the case of that particular uh, lecturer. So there are some cases where we might encounter some difficulties, but very often the variations are not severe enough to impede mutual understanding. Like for example, in, uh, in Nepal, there is a tendency when you have sia, it becomes shia. Uh, some Sanskritists from India feel very uncomfortable with that, but usually we can recognize it. So personally, I don't find that it is a very big deal. I have a okay. question that, um kind of tags along to this comment about learning in the um, monastic. So there's a comment here, your method is similar to monastic learning. We come with several languages and many dialects. First, we chant clumsily and improve, then the cognitive yeah. understanding arises, then deepens, similar to learning by immersion and to how children learn speech. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dissociation of sound and object, unmediated too much by sign and symbolism. And that's totally opposite from, of course, how I learned Sanskrit um, and how it's taught in graduate school in, in most universities in the US and I imagine in Europe as well. Um, but another thing that I've noticed in the monastic context is a lot of time that chanting is going along with a bodily movement. <laughs> Yes, I don't I'm know. wondering that, I, if you have any anything to say about that, because to me, that seems actually a key. There's something about that movement that uh, maybe it's not just mm -hmm. only that movement. Maybe there's mm -hmm. other movements, too. But I'm just curious if you have any reflections on on that or monastic learning in general. Yeah, I think that that happens. That, that's my guess. That happens for two reasons. One is because the chant has a certain rhythm. So at some point, one is going to be moved by the rhythm automatically. That, that I think that is one reason. The second point is something which I, I can take from the musical tradition. If you observe some classical singers, you will see that they have certain gestures that are recurrent. Like, uh, 
I think one can learn different types of music to kind of enhance one's chanting. I personally have decided to focus on one tradition called Drupad, which is a kind of a, maybe in some ways it retains the most archaic aspects of uh, South Asian music. And in that tradition, there is also some attention to mudra. So for example, when singing, keeping the hand like this, or sometimes you see that when, when, uh, um, when uh, one is, uh, when one is singing some certain types of notes, they will point. So that is not, it's also something that the teacher will recommend to do because there is a connection between visual imagination and sound. And this is rather developed in the teaching of music. Uh, my teacher sometimes explains things by speaking of water, speaking of the different elements, or giving it sometimes even by drawing something. Like you should sing this note like this, and she would draw something. And, and I think that actually that helps a lot. In fact, this is something that one will notice when even learning one paradigm. I think most people who have this experience of learning one paradigm of the world Buddha or of the world Rama will know that somewhere in the mind there is a visual image of that paradigm. And uh, I think the movement of the body has something to do with that. We have a certain visual image of uh, processes through time which are synthesizing those processes. And we repeat that visual image also with our body to some extent, because that is the, the challenge when we chant or even we learn music, I think. It's a process through time. So there is actually momentary events, but we have to gather a kind of mental image of the whole. Yes, I forgot to bring in the um, the example of a song that uh, I like to bring up very often, speaking of the Shastras, when I was saying it's a holistic system. Now, some of the people here would have heard me say this already several times because I like this example. Now, let me actually go specifically to Drupad, and I would invite all of you to listen to some Drupad if you have a chance. The characteristic of, of Drupad is to focus on the raga. So the raga means kind of a scale, but actually a raga is a person. That's what the raga is. So what one does through Drupad is to introduce a person immediately. Just use a few notes, which are so characteristic of that person that the listener will immediately perceive it. So the point of Drupad is not so much to develop a very complex melody or something very virtuosistic, but to focus on the characteristics of that person. And you see, this is a kind of paradox because we do that through time. So how is it possible that through time we are able to give such a clear image of the whole? And this is what happens in my opinion with Sanskrit Shastras. If we become familiar with the Abhidharma Gosha Bhashya, if somebody gives us a bit of a Bhashya, which we might not remember exactly, we will know, oh, this must be coming from the Bhashya. And this is an experience which is quite interesting with the, Shant with the Sanskrit Shastras. You read a lot of Prasannapada, then someone throws in two sentences from the Prasannapada, immediately you feel, oh, this must be coming from the Prasannapada. This really sounds like Samadhi Raja Sutra feel. So each text, in a way, is like its own song, its own raga, in, in that sense. That's why I think that the, the example works somewhat well. So I wanted to, we have about 15 minutes left for questions. So I wanted to encourage, especially people who might be prospective students. And Mattia had mentioned, you know, he'd like to address if you have any like what you might be apprehensive about or um, 
just any kind of questions, especially, you know, maybe even if they're simple questions, welcome, welcome those. Yeah, I see one of them. I see a question, which is a very simple question. What's the picture in Mattia Salvini's background? <laughs> those are some, uh, I think, ghosts going to a pilgrimage to the mountain of Manjushri. So that, that's what it is. Okay. In Judaism as well. Yes, actually, there's, um, I can uh, mention that talking about people of different uh, backgrounds learning Sanskrit, why did I get to teach Sanskrit to people from Cambodia, Indonesia, etc.? Because I was teaching a course called uh, Rhetoric for Leadership. And my solution to this uh, discomfort of teaching a course with such a name was that I taught Alankara Shastra to those people. And um, to some people I asked to learn a Sanskrit verse, to some other people I, I said, well, why don't you just learn something from a tradition you're familiar with, your, a language, a classical language you're familiar with and explain why you picked that one. And some of people did that. And the students, some of the students who responded very well were Muslim students from Indonesia who were telling me, yes, for us, chanting the Quran is so important. And what they did was very nice because we had learned some good things, some subhajita in Sanskrit. And what they did is that they picked some part of the Quran, which they felt was like a proverb or a good thing and which could apply to people in general. So this kind of method actually, I believe exists in many traditions. And the idea of reading silently, actually something uh, relatively recent, I believe even in Europe, I think that um, a few hundred years ago, it was very common to read loudly, even uh, in, in Europe. And uh, that gives us a problem as translators, because we, well, at least I can speak for myself. Most of us don't do very well translating meter as meter. And therefore we do not produce translated texts which are very good to be chanted while people used to be able to do so. And some people are trying to do that and sometimes with very good results, like for example, uh, Kutan Imatam, translated by Chaba and Dominic Gooder, very nice translation from the Sanskrit in English verse. And unfortunately in English, I found that uh, it's not such a common ability. I'm disappointed in myself for not being able to do that much, and I would like to improve on it, but I think chanting English also is good. There's a couple in the of film, yes, sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just, you're looking at them maybe. I was gonna say there's a couple questions about resources for um, studying Sanskrit online. Oh yeah, yeah, there's some, uh, yes, thank you for, Thank, thank you, Trent, for mentioning my channel. I didn't want to do it. I did it in a kind of subtle, subliminal advertisement way in the beginning because that R happens to be the logo of the channel. But I didn't want to say it. And maybe you That's, could also share some of that chanting that you were going to share um, if because they think oh, there's yes. time for that as well. But you can also finish answering the, the question in the chat. Uh, yes, maybe what I can do is that uh, later, if the, this, this is going to be an available video, so I could actually post the, the, those uh, links to the chants sure. by this yeah. friend. Yep. Does anyone know of a website where I can learn how to pronounce Sanskrit properly, correctly? Yes, there's lots of them. Um, is there any other question or was that the last question? That was the last one. So I thought there would be time to, and the other ones about other resources as well. So we could oh, post some links together with the video if you want to share the um, video, your videos there. Yes, let me see if I can catch the one which I felt was most interesting. Yes, here it is. Let me just now share the video. Uh, I do not know what you're seeing now. Are you seeing the YouTube channel? Yes, we see okay. the, yeah. 
and we also yeah. see the side thing. I don't know if, yeah, you probably need to keep it small. Okay, wait one moment. My YouTube is a little slow. Um, so yeah, just give, I'll give you an example from Indonesia. Uh, these were students who, I have to stress, had no background in Sanskrit and they were students of orthoprosthetics coming from different parts of Southeast Asia, uh, from different backgrounds, also one student from Africa. And I asked them, what is your favorite Sanskrit verse? And each of them had to chant a verse and tell us why it's interesting. This reason, so is an example. I would like to present the first that I'm so interested with it, oh, okay. Pushpam, pushpam, vijin, vita, mula jedam na karaet, malakara ivarame, nayatangara karaka. So, okay, now she's going to explain why she chose the verse, etc., etc. But I'm really impressed. Never studied Sanskrit before, and she found her own melody, which is metrically correct and I find quite beautiful. Yes, there might be some very tiny irregularity in the pronunciation, but it's tiny and I like very much the pronunciation. And students from different parts of Southeast Asia did the same thing. Uh, let me see if I can find a student from Cambodia. Uh, yes, for example, this student from Cambodia also found her own melody, which to me sounds a little bit Cambodian, also like some Thai music. Here I have chosen one of the words from your anthology to memorize. And it is about Nanda's wife, while she was from Nagana. No, sorry, Sandra Nanda. And she was very sadness because she couldn't see he return as his promise. So let me start now. So, so again, some irregularities, but I think sounds very nice. She came up with her own melody and kept the regularity of the rhythm. So this is something that anyone even with no background in Sanskrit can do. It's also a little bit creative. And uh, this is what I would encourage Sanskrit students to do. Find some text that you like and find a way that you're comfortable uh, that respects the basic features of the text, the basic rhythmic features of the text, but at the same time, do not worry too much if the melody is not identical to what the instructor has to offer, it's not really a problem. So I have um, maybe another, another video that I could show from China because, and I would like to show it because I found that some Chinese friends sometimes are a little bit worried about their pronunciation and their ability to reproduce Sanskrit well. And uh, I can say that I have lots of students in Taiwan and China, and they're so good. They are very um, disciplined, and they're very good in pronouncing Sanskrit. Now, he's talking in Sanskrit. This is a tribute to Professor Ramshankar Vigal. So this is another thing. He, he learned some spoken Sanskrit, again, something very useful. I would recommend everyone to do that. And uh, he wrote his own uh, introduction to the chants that they're going to make in honor of Professor Ramshankar Tripathi. It's not grammatically perfect, but he can convey the meaning he wants to convey. And that's another point. We should never be scared of making mistakes. Uh, whether it is in spoken language, in our pronunciation or whatever, making mistakes is the only way to learn. 
So uh, that's what I used to do. I tried to speak Sanskrit with everyone I could when I was a student in India. M my friend, the late Lobzonor Bushastri, he was also in favor of that. When he came to Chennai, he would speak in Sanskrit to everyone. Like we would go to shops, he would just speak to people in Sanskrit. And uh, it was just a way to exercise. So it doesn't matter, even if we make mistakes, etc. I noticed that people are especially anxious about making mistakes in pronunciation in Sanskrit. And this is, a, it's not, it's not a big deal. It's the same as in any other language. We just have to slowly improve and refine our pronunciation throughout our lives. I think in any language we speak, we always have scope for improvement, but I think they do well. They're these students, let me show you some of the actual recitation. So you see, I think that the pronunciation is rather clear. Also very nicely chanted in unison, oh, sorry. So I would uh, recommend anyone who wants to learn Sanskrit to try going in this direction of including chant as much as possible. And uh, the rest will develop somewhat naturally. And also not to be too anxious. Is my pronunciation perfect? Am I understanding every little bit straight away? Of course, it's easier when we do not have too much pressure in respect to examinations. <laughs> that, that is one issue that people are worried about. Oh, I have to do my homework, then I have to take an exam. But uh, this depends from your instructors as well, how uh, strict they're going to be about that and what they're going to value and evaluate in terms of your learning. I think actually I recommend people not to translate much in the first two or three years of their Sanskrit learning and to rely rather on uh, learning from someone, discussing the words, discussing the texts, rather than straight away jumping into doing a dictionary kind of translation because becoming over reliant on dictionaries in the case of Sanskrit especially is not very good. It brings us far away from the etymology. So this is one thing that uh, Karen you will see in, the, in my grammar. I geared it towards seeing the relationship with the dhatu, which is really the strength of Sanskrit in my opinion. It's something that was pointed out long time ago I think very perceptibly by Fenoloza. Fenoloza was a, an American diplomat, I believe in Japan, a friend of Ezra Pound, who wrote a text on the Chinese uh, characters uh, as a means of poetry, where he also discusses Sanskrit. And one of the things it points out is that one of the strengths of Sanskrit is that is this very perceptible connection to the dhatu, to the root, which represents an action and which brings immediate life to each and every Sanskrit word. That's why when we rely too much on the translation method, we flatten the, the, the beauty of Sanskrit in a way. So from that perspective, I would say, now we have the good luck of uh, so many internet readings, uh, both pre-recorded and live. So don't feel shy to join those readings, even if you are an absolute beginner and you cannot follow well. Follow as many readings as you can, be exposed to the language as much as you can, and this will be a more natural way to become acquainted with Sanskrit. Okay, yeah. Um, is there any other question? Yeah, there's a question in the chat here about um, spoken Sanskrit. I oh, mean, yeah, yeah. you've 
<laughs> talked a little bit about spoken Sanskrit, but places in India where, where their whole villages will speak Sanskrit. Yes, one is called Mathura, I think, in Karnataka. And actually there is a whole movement. I think it's very good um, and it's very useful. I learned to speak Sanskrit to some extent. I used to speak with Professor Ram Shankar Trivati because my Hindi is very bad. I find Hindi much more difficult than Sanskrit. And uh, so we used to communicate in Sanskrit and with a few other people as well. Now, the Sanskrit Bharati is very good. There is one aspect of Sanskrit, spoken Sanskrit learning that I might warn you about, which is in India nowadays, it tends sometimes to be associated with a certain type of political framework that not everyone might be perfectly at ease with. So sometimes you might have to kind of uh, be patient in that respect. Be aware that uh, there is an unfortunate connection between nationalism and language learning in many parts of the world, and this includes India. And of course, with a language like Sanskrit, this can come up. Uh, I do not think of Sanskrit as an Indian language, actually. That No, this is an entirely different long discussion, but I don't like to think of it in those terms. And therefore, I'm completely out of that kind of mentality. But uh, they have very good resources in Sanskrit Abharati, which are available also online. And I would recommend you to use their videos to learn some spoken Sanskrit. Great. Well, we have time for if there's just one, one, well, we're just at 7.30 now. My clock just changed. But if there's one final question, we can take it. I will also post. Again, um, the link to the upcoming programs. And we'll also be, if there were points in the lecture that you missed, we'll be sending you the recording um, to everyone who registered. Okay, there's one last question. If Sanskrit is not Indian, then what is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, my point is that uh, India is a modern geopolitical entity which doesn't necessarily reflect ideas like Jambu Dweeba or Madhya Desha or Arya Vishaya or Arya Varta. And therefore, I do not think that we need to associate Sanskrit very strongly with a modern nation state, which is a modern phenomenon coming from a certain uh, ideology, which actually is from Europe. So, but this is a very big discussion. So I do not think I can do justice to this question. I hope that this brief hint gives an idea of what I mean. So Sanskrit is older than India. <laughs> yes, that is my basic point. And also it was circulating much more broadly. Not many people know that probably the largest uh, institute in ancient time for Sanskrit learning was not in India. That is something that most people are not aware of. And they will not tell you where it was. You have to check. <laughs> most people think of Nalanda, but there was another place which apparently was much larger. And uh, that area produced very great Sanskritists. We have at least one very beautiful work from that area. So I will not tell you, you have to check. Okay. To be continued. <laughs> so thank you so much, Mattia. Thank you, thank everyone, you for attending. Nice to see some of you. Nice to see you, Philippe. <laughs> um, so, yeah, great. See you all later. Bye.